We've got a very special Where Is Our Historian for you today. We're here at the Lackawaxen River, the site of one of four suspension aqueducts built by John Roebling for the d &H Canal Company in the 1840s. We've been to this site numerous times, uh, but only this year were we able to see this amazing uh, artifact, the, the sign of the center pier. Our guest today is my friend, colleague, and excellent historian, John Roebling expert, Professor Paul King, who will talk about this interesting artifact that only uncovered this season. So I'm standing in the middle of the Lackawaxen River on what would have been the foundation of the mid-river pier of the Lackawaxen Aqueduct. The span was 115 feet from the abutment you can see behind me to where I'm standing, and then another 115 feet to the other side to the second abutment. If you look closely, you can see the remnants of some of the stone wall. It clearly has fallen over to one side. And the way that this is made is there are large timbers. There are 44 of them running crosswise. And you can see these long metal spikes. These spikes are at least two feet long. And then we've got a set of timbers, 13 of them, going in the other direction. So you've got this cross grid of large timbers in one direction and a second set in the other. And this would have created the foundation for putting the stone base on for building the Mid-River Pier. And you can see on the top of the abutment, you can see the prism of the aqueduct. And if you look to either side, you can see the stone pyramids raising up. Sitting on top of those would have been cast iron saddles designed to hold the suspension cable. And where I'm standing, you would have had a pier equal in height with two more suspension saddles, cast iron, and then the cable would have spun across. There would have been one cable on each side. It was about seven inches in diameter. When the aqueduct originally was here, it ran just above where you see the highway running across. And it was R.F. Lord who came up with the idea that instead of continuing the canal to the end and go straight across the Delaware River, that he had a solution that included two aqueducts. So in addition to the Delaware aqueduct, this is where the Lackawaxen aqueduct went across. The two of them were built between 1847 and 1848 and opened for the 1848 season. So an interesting point of history at this particular spot, there was actually a failure of the pier and the canal actually leaked. And during the time that it was leaking, no boats would have been able to pass and essentially they would have backed up on either side and the canal would have been out of commission for a period of time. Eventually they were able to repair that breach. Uh, part of the problem was the water was rushing so fast, it was very difficult to actually expedite that repair. We're happy you were able to join us today it's moments like these that are really rewarding to us historians. We've been to this site many, many times, but the water was always much higher. And for all we know, this may be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, this has added significantly to our knowledge about how John Roebling designed these innovative structures. Today, we also discovered that the second pier, you see behind me, there's one abutment. We were told that the other abutment, all the stone was taken to use in a church but Professor King was out there climbing through the, the rubble and we discovered a lot of that abutment is actually intact, but simply overgrown. We're aware the facing has been removed. So you have to picture these anchor chains. There's another section of anchor chains that would have gone up further and the pyramid would have been up there. Well, this is a unique opportunity, Paul. We always thought that this abutment was completely gone, but uh, climbing into the underbrush, and we couldn't have done this in the summer. It, it, no wonder we believed the story that it was all gone. But, be, but with the 10 foot gone, uh, on the other side, those are buried. We wouldn't be able to see the tops of those because the other sides are, are, are buried. So the prism likely went another 10 feet out and the facing of that stone is gone and the pyramids that the cast iron saddles would have sat on, that's gone as well. So, but we are seeing the rest of the anchor chains are still here and the anchor plates are still gonna be down below. And so there's much more here than we really thought there was. And it's great to come seasons, especially in the fall, to see something we might not otherwise be able to see. And this is really fortuitous timing because um, we have not yet submitted to the National Park Service uh, the resource table 
Uh, and there's an awful lot more information that we can add about what is still extant. We have over 411 extant features now individually listed on the update to the National Historic Register. Uh, but we were saying this was gone and now we know otherwise. And now we can add that we have those wood remnants in the center of the river. Very exciting day here. Here on this side, we can see that there are in fact seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven anchor bars that come up through the stone. And if we look closely, you can see here one dot, then one, then two, then two, then three, then three. So it's putting these in order. And I think the reason you would key them on either side is to make sure that they're not flipped in the wrong direction. But essentially, these are instructions to the contractor to make sure that they're put in the proper order. And th these would have been contractors working directly under John Roblin, unlike the masonry, which was done by a, a different contractor. And so with seven of these, we know that there were 14 strands that made up the cables, ultimately. So just to clarify, the 14 strands were seven strands that then split to 14 when they went around the cast iron shoes. And here would have been the pin to go across, and then there would be another set of anchor chains that would have extended up to where the cast iron saddle would have been. And then from the cast iron saddle, the span would have gone across the river. So this is an amazing opportunity to see. And if we look closely underneath, it's a little hard to see, but there is the remnant of the support stone, which was sort of a T-shaped stone. There's one here, and there's one here, and portion of that has been gone. So there would have been a cast iron plate sitting underneath here as a bearing plate, and then there would have been a piece of stone, and that would have been the point where the chain articulates. Remember that this chain is going down, and then goes down, and then goes down vertical to a large six foot square cast iron plate. Sitting on top of that is a wooden timber foundation, similar to what we saw in the middle of the river, and that would have gone straight across and because aqueducts essentially are symmetrical, we would have had the same setup on both sides. If we look back here, you can see the remnants of the stone. So this would have been the natural prism. So all of the stone here, right, is no longer present. And then this continues back and it goes eventually and meets the Delaware aqueduct. A terrific day today. The research on this important history continues to this day.